According to the global report on food crises, close to 200 million people are experiencing food insecurity and are in need of urgent assistance across 53 countries and territories. For Indonesia, the global wheat supply chain disruption in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine conflict has highlighted Indonesia's dependence on wheat imports. In this episode of CNA Correspondent, my colleague Saiful Bahri Ismail and I, Chani Vatvani, take a closer look at what Indonesia is doing to take advantage of its sustainable crops. Yeah. Fifty-six-year-old farmer Daksoko is wetting the soil for his sorghum fields. The grains of the crop are small, round, and have several varieties. Sorghum is also adaptive in nature and resistant to drought, growing best in warm weathers and requiring very little water. Despite the relative ease at which it has grown, Mr. Daksoko, who has been a farmer for over two decades, says sorghum isn't a popular choice. Masalahnya untuk sorghum itu tanaman yang menurut saya itu tidak utama dalam arti kita yang utama itu tanam pertama dan kedua itu padi. Untuk masa tanam kedua menjelang kemarau itu tanam sorghum. Jadi lahan itu daripada lahan kosong tidak tertanami tanam sorghum lebih bermanfaat. According to the FAO, sorghum is among the leading cereal crops of the world and amid the looming threat of a global food crisis, here in Indonesia, President Joko Widodo is looking to boost diversification of food staples and reduce dependency. Banyak pilihan-pilihan yang bisa kita kerjakan di negara kita diversifikasi pangan alternatif alternatif bahan pangan tidak hanya tergantung pada beras karena kita memiliki jagung memiliki sagu dan juga ini sebetulnya tanaman lama kita yang ketiga adalah sorghum about two hours away from the city of Solo in central Java, efforts are underway by the central Java provincial government to optimize sorghum farming in Wonogiri Regency. Authorities have prepared 120 hectares of land in three regencies in the province, with Wonogiri Regency having the largest allocation of 60 hectares spread across three villages. According to the Central Java Agricultural and Farming Agency, sorghum crop productivity can reach between 8 to 9 tons for every hectare of land, which means 120 hectares could produce over 1,000 tons under the right conditions such as focus on the growth of the crop with the addition of fertilizers. One hectare of land here is currently producing up to 4 tons of sorghum at maximum capacity. Prices for one kilogram generally fluctuate depending on the market. It has gone as low as 10 US cents and as high as 39 cents. While each kilogram sells for about 29 cents at the moment, farmers say they would be more motivated if authorities helped to determine a standard cost of goods sold. Menurut Bapak, kalau tantangan terbesar untuk para petani untuk nanam sorghum itu seperti apa, Pak? Kalau tantangan terbesar sebenarnya ada di harga. Nah ini kita yang dibutuhkan itu campur tangan dari pemerintah. Alhamdulillah Pak Jokowi saat ini sudah mengangkat di tahun 2022 ini. Mudah-mudahan benar-benar harga itu kita bisa dijamin. Harapan kami sebenarnya pemerintah mengadakan HPP, harga pokok. Kalau pasar sudah dijamin, harga dijamin, petani tidak usah disuruh pasti. Tak mau target berapa kita siap. Once the crop has been hand harvested, the cut heads of sorghum are piled up and allowed to dry on sheaves in the field or on the threshing floor. After the grains have dried up, they are ready for the next step, threshing. 
The farmers here still use traditional threshing methods, and that involves manually striking sorghum heads with a stick. Tukiran tells me he can obtain 50 kilograms of sorghum after two hours of threshing. Once the grain is separated, it can be polished into rice or ground into sorghum flour, which can be used as an alternative to wheat flour. Despite having health benefits like being naturally gluten-free and high in fiber, it still is not a common ingredient nor a daily staple, even though it can be. Here, the grains have been made into pop gum. Mm. And it tastes just like popcorn. Authorities say they are laying the groundwork for a steady market when it comes to processing sorghum post-harvest. Kita siapkan beras sorghum tidak hanya sampai di beras, mestinya sampai di tepung. Tepung tidak hanya sampai di tepung, mesti kan mesti kita siapkan untuk paolan pangan. Apakah itu jadi roti pengganti gandum? ataukah cemilan yang lain dan itu harus dimulai dari pemerintahan yang sudah kita lakukan gerakan-gerakan di luar sorghum artinya gerakan pangan lokal di pemerintah daerah banyak kabupaten kan sudah jalan itu artinya kita tinggal numpang aja ke sorghumnya but these efforts need to be accelerated and more needs to be done on a massive scale socially if sorghum is to become a staple alternative Sorghum kita olah untuk menjadi produk pangan baik kek, roti ataupun e, pengganti nasi itu kualitasnya masih bisa berubah-ubah. Oleh karena itu teknologi perlu diperkuat. Kemudian di sektor on farmnya posisi sorghum ini tidak dalam kerangka pemberian subsidi pupuk. Oleh karena itu bantuan pemerintah yang saat ini turun kepada kami berupa benih, saya kira e, belum cukup untuk bisa mengenjot e, produksi. The Indonesian government is working on a roadmap for sorghum development until 2024. Authorities are targeting for sorghum to be planted in more than 150,000 hectares of land across the country. But in order to do that, Indonesia will have to undertake massive efforts to not only familiarize people with the crop, but also ensure that quantity is in line with quality. Coming up next, my colleague Saifulbari Ismail takes a look at one healthy crop which has been touted as an alternative commodity in Indonesia's efforts to diversify its national food supply. Sago palm trees, as far as the eye can see. They grow in abundance in Maranti Islands, Regency, Riau province. Suharjo recalls he was just 17 years old when he started work in a sago plantation. Over time, Suharjo managed to save money and buy a small plot of land to grow sago palm trees. The 73-year-old is now a successful farmer and owns 40 hectares of sago plantations. Ibarat pepatah, susah dulu, senang kemudian. Ya. Selama itu saya ya sudah berhasil, saya bisa menyolahkan anak, sudah akan melepaskan beban saya. Anak mau keluarga, saya laksanakan, ambil uang untuk biaya semuanya. Cita -cita saya bisa naik aji. Indonesia has the largest land area fit to grow sago palm trees in the world. However, the Agriculture Ministry says only 5% of the land is being cultivated and one of the areas is in Riau. Sago is not a popular commodity because it takes about 10 years to get the first harvest when beginning to grow the crop in new locations. Despite this, authorities are encouraging farmers to grow sago palm trees in an effort to diversify Indonesia's national food supply. Kita pun sudah tahu pak dari awal itu ya nana penanaman ini tidak mudah gitu selain sampai berhasil itu tidak mudah. 
karena kita kan dah belajar juga dengan orang-orang tua kita yang terlebih dahulu di sini gitu karena untuk satu kali penanaman itu belum tentu berhasil karena masih ada penyelaman penyelaman gitu lanjutan itu makanya kita kan udah tidak terkejut lah kalau untuk masyarakat di sini kan kalau ibaratnya itu kita nanam 100 hidup aja 50 itu udah syukur gitu Sego Production Factories are also thriving in the Meranti Islands Regency. They are located near the Sego plantations and are built close to the riverbanks. The trunks of the Sego palm trees need to be wet and are immersed in water so that they can be preserved longer. Each trunk weighs about 20 kilograms and it's kept in water for up to two months before being towed up to the factory to be processed. Farmers sell the trunks to factories at a price of 50,000 rupiah or about 3 US dollars each. Sego production is still very labor intensive. For example, workers have to cut the trunk of the sego palm into smaller pieces before putting it into the grinder. This factory has the capacity to produce 10 tons of sego flour per day and contributes to the economy of residents in the nearby villages. It employs more than 50 workers and the majority of them live close to the factory. Tinus is the owner of the factory and he's continuing a trade which has stretched for three generations. He admits that it's possible to automate a few tasks in the manufacturing process with the current technology available in the market. For example, machines can help cut the trunks of the sago palm trees. However, there are other factors to consider. Biaya kita tu sudah terlalu tinggi. Ah, beli alat ni sudah tinggi. Ujung-ujung kan kita pun tak ada ada untung. Ya, di pasar juga. Betul tak? Ya. Ah, nama kan kita kan dagang. Mau mau pandai hitung juga. Ya. Lu beli tangki, okey, bisa. Bisa orang bikin, tapi Dia punya biaya kalau tinggi kita ujung-ujung kita dugi di situ. Indonesia experiences frequent forest fires partly due to farmers using the slash and burn method to clear their land during the dry season. In 2015, more than 2.6 million hectares of forests, the majority of them peatlands, were destroyed by fires blanketing the region with haze. Riau was one of the worst hit provinces. The Pitland and Mangrove Restoration Agency, or BRGM, has worked with communities to revitalize the peatlands and cultivate crops like sago that can grow well in wet conditions. Nah, hal ini itu sebenarnya terkait dengan pengeringan eh, yang terjadi di areal gambut itu. Tapi kalau kemudian sebelum itu, ketika ini memang benar-benar masih menjadi areal-areal budidaya sagu, karena sagu memang identik dengan areal-areal yang basah, sebenarnya kebakaran hutan dan lahan barangkali pernah terjadi, tapi sangat dengan skala yang sangat kecil sekali. Sagu ini memang harus terus dikembangkan kalau kita bicara soal bahwa ini juga termasuk upaya kita untuk bagaimana melakukan penanggulangan atau pencegahan terhadap kebakaran hutan dan lahan. In 2020, BRGM started a revitalization program in Bagan Melibur village allocating 25 hectares of land for farmers to grow sago palm trees. However, challenges remain as people are still not eating sago so much. The Agriculture Ministry says the average person in Indonesia only consumes about 0.5 kilogram of sago per year as compared to 95 kilograms for rice. Dengan program kedai kopi kami BRGM itu ada pengembangan untuk membuat sagu itu menjadi popmi. Jadi tinggal diseduh gitu. Jadi sebenarnya bicara soal ketahanan pangan, mendesertifikasi, bagaimana memunculkan produk-produk yang memang ramah atau yang dikenal oleh masyarakat luas. Gak kebayang kalau ternyata dari sagu itu bisa dibikin mie, bisa dibikin kerupuk, bisa dibikin beras, dan rasanya gak beda. Gitu. One of the more popular food products made from sago flour is noodles. From the field to the dining table, I'm having sago noodles for lunch, which can be cooked in various ways. I'm having mine fried.
Sago noodles has a smooth taste which is different from wheat flour noodles. Sago has the potential to be an alternative food commodity and help reduce dependence on other crops like rice and wheat. More creativity, innovation and awareness may be needed to encourage consumers to weigh their options and make Sago a sustainable agriculture choice of the future. Next, CNA correspondent looks at how communities are making natural dyes from mangrove, another sustainable resource in Indonesia. The majestic Indragiri River, one of the longest rivers in Indonesia. The meandering river stretches to more than 500 kilometers in Riau province, the lifeblood of people living along its banks. There are also many settlements along thousands of tributaries which lead to the Indragiri River. Indra Gili Hilir Regency is known as the land of a thousand trenches. In the past, communities built trenches to stake their claim on a piece of land. Over the years, these trenches have become rivers and mangroves grow along the banks. Samsia lives in Harapantani village and in the morning she looks for mangrove trees which are found close to the sides of the river. She collects the leaves and fruits of the mangrove trees to make natural dyes. The bark of the tree is also useful as it gives a different colour. The 47-year-old who works as a seamstress uses the dyes she prepares at home to colour her fabrics. Samsia's interest in natural dye started after she attended training in 2021 organized by the Pitland and Mangrove Restoration Agency or BRGM. Her passion has spread to other women in the village who actively help out in the process of making the natural dyes. Kita di situ kan hanya menggunakan dedaunan yang ada di alam. Nah, jadi kita pun tahu kalau di daerah kita pun ada. Nah, di situ saya mulai tertarik. Kalau untuk mangrove kita cukup karena di sini sepanjang sungai Indragiri Hilir ini itu ditumbuhi oleh pohon mangrove. Nah, karena ini aliran sungai tak air tawar gitu jadi tidak ada yang banyak tumbuh. Kita menggunakan pewarna alam itu tersedia ada di daerah kita. Tak perlu kita membeli lagi cuma kita hanya butuh kesabaran untuk memprosesnya. Samsia and her friends spent a lot of time experimenting to get the right color. The leaves, fruits and barks of the mangrove tree are weighed carefully before being soaked over time in specific amounts of water. The base color of the dye from the bark is dark brown, while the leaf and fruit produce shades of yellow. These are fruits from the mangrove tree. They are called mangrove apple fruits and they are edible. The fruit has a really sour taste and I'm told locals here make fruit juice out of this. Samsia is motivated to make the natural dyes because she knows they are more environmentally friendly as compared with synthetic ones. For example, the wastewater from the production of natural dyes is not toxic and doesn't cause any environmental pollution. Students from Gajah Mada University in Yogyakarta were also interested to find out more about the science of natural dyes. Kami ingin melihat potensi alam di daerah yang bisa berpotensi untuk uh, sebagai pewarna alami. Sekalian untuk menumbuhkan ekonomi lokal di daerah ini. Jadi kita meneliti, kita ambil tumbuhan-tumbuhan uh, yang ada di sekitar sini, terus kita uh, kirim ke Kampus nanti dari kampus yang meneliti lebih lebih dalam lagi. Benar gak sih ini bisa berpotensi untuk uh, pewarna alami? The leaves and flowers collected can also be used for eco printing. It's a form of natural dyeing where the colors from plant materials are transferred onto a fabric. The resulting product is a beautiful, unique, and eco-friendly piece of art. 
School children are also learning about natural dyes and eco printing. Jadi manfaatnya bagi anak-anak kami adalah anak-anak kami ini kami harapkan supaya dia mencintai lingkungannya. Ini mudah-mudahan di sini harapan kami ke depannya adalah dengan anak mencoba seperti ini suatu saat nanti dia terpikir untuk membuat uh, semacam usaha yang keterkaitan dengan ekoprint tersebut karena saya rasa ini juga peluangnya cukup bagus. There are plans to introduce the natural dyes and eco printing lessons to other schools. Indonesia has the largest mangrove forest area in the world. It has 3.3 million hectares of mangrove forests. That's about 20% of the total mangrove forests globally. The government has a target to restore 600,000 hectares of mangrove forests by 2024, but only 10% of it was completed in 2021. Authorities hope that greater awareness about the benefits of mangrove can enthuse communities towards conservation. Jadi pewarnaan alam ini kita anggap sebagai salah satu metode bukan cuma sekedar gimmick-gimmick seperti itu. Karena setelah dihitung-hitung secara ekonomis, kalau ini diseriusi, ini bisa menjadi sumber ekonomi yang cukup tinggi. Karena nggak semua tempat bisa menghasilkan tanaman atau vegetasi yang punya pigmen warna dan mereka punya itu. Bapak Ibu kemudian akan lebih menjaga mangrupnya karena mereka menghitung setiap buah yang dihasilkan bisa menghasilkan sekian. Environmentalists say the presence of mangroves indicate a healthy and balanced river habitat. However, a more deliberate and conscious approach may be needed. Saya kira sampai hari ini sejauh yang Walhi pelajari belum ditemukan memang satu regulasi khusus yang e, melindungi wilayah-wilayah mangrove di wilayah-wilayah sungai. Selama ini misalnya ada e, beberapa regulasi itu mangrove di wilayah pesisir. Tapi di wilayah sungainya itu memang saya kira penting untuk menjadi agenda pemerintah untuk memproteksi dan memulihkan di e, wilayah sungai ini. Nah, jadi saya kira e, itu yang e, ke depan penting didorong oleh pemerintah. With or without regulations, residents of Harapan Tani, like Samsia, are committed to conserving and protecting the mangrove habitat. Samsia has seen the fruits of a labour flourish and she dreams of making Kempas District as the centre of natural dye production in the province.